I would uh, like to to introduce you to Greg, who will be joining me live. Hey, how are you Hi, doing? Hey, I, I'm I'm okay. I'm just about recovering from jumping out of my skin when the theme music kicked on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, hopefully, we've adjusted the sound on. Yeah, that. we we did, but I still wasn't ready for it. <laughs> uh, so, how how are you doing today, Greg? I'm, you've been, uh, been a bit busy jumping on. Video cast to video cast. Yes, I'm being I'm being mocked shamelessly for uh well I'm being mocked rightfully for shameless self promotions. I should say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been so, uh, it's been a busy day. Well, it's it's interesting times because the the nine to five is kind of gone, isn't it? So it's uh you just kind of glued to a desk all the time, and then you occasionally hop on over to a couch to eat a warm meal and get back to the desk. So yeah. But we we work in cyber, mate. We we never really had a nine to five, to be honest. So. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. So, so congratulations on your on releasing your book. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I was mocking you this morning. Uh, uh, you you, why, why, why you chose the color yellow? Uh, uh, so, I'm um, before we get into it, I'm just curious as to where that came from. There's some psychology behind that, right? Is there not? To be honest, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't really thought about it. I used the uh, the Amazon cover generator. Yellow was the first <laughs> color that popped up. Uh, it's, it's actually going to be a series of three books. So the first one is, is and people that follow me know this, it's, it's really about we need to stop doing security from a primarily re detect and respond to a reactive standpoint. There's there's so many upstream issues that, that cause 95% of our workload, but we say, oh, that's IT's job, or oh, management doesn't listen, or oh, the board doesn't care. And that's just not true. And you, we can do things to engage those things and, and significantly improve, reduce our workload, but more than more than anything else, improve assurance and also spend a lot less money, which uh, we should be accountable for. Um, so that, that's one. And then there's two more. One's going to be more about the engagement uh, and building a, a brand and influence and that kind of stuff to actually get things done. That's the next one. And then there's going to be another one about how I actually structure frameworks. And they're they're blue and green. And it's just I thought the three colors look nice together. It'll excellent. You know, all, all three of them will look nice on the shelf. That's that's Perfect. the only rationale behind that. So a question, a question for you then, is is it designed for people that work in InfoSec or is it a broader general public consumption type of? Um, it's it's non-technical, mm. so it's it's anyone could read it. Uh, it's aimed, uh, I guess, at helping InfoSec people um, work better, specifically if you're, if you're kind of in the management slash CISO area, middle management to CISO. Uh, that said, I think I think the kind of leadership and, and human soft skills and, and engagement and, and out of the box thinking are, are some of the, the things we're really, really lacking. So it, it cannot hurt to uh, get those concepts in as early as possible because most people study InfoSec and they become analysts or pen testers and they've got that very narrow focus. Uh, I, I took it as a great compliment because Dr. Uh, Mansour Hasib, he, I guess you bought a copy because he was saying how he's actually using some of the analogy in, in the book in one of his classes at university. So that that's nice. Uh, so yeah, I, I just I tried to make it as as open uh, to everyone as possible. It's, it's quite accessible in terms of language and concepts. So 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 what would you what would you say? Sort of the three main takeaways. You, you talk about rethink rethinking infosec. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a very broad title, right? So so. Uh, as, as, a, as a as a CISO myself, what would you be telling me that I need to rethink about the way that I potentially do uh, the organization? Be be pro be proactive. Uh, in, engage and uh, in, engage the business and engage people. I think most most of the breaches we see are are very simple technical causes, but it's stuff like they they just didn't know about the existence of that business process or that system. So it's if you don't know the system exists. Well, your asset management, your agents, your EDR, none of that's going to matter because you don't know it exists. So, yeah, that's going to be the entry point, and that's pretty much what happened to Equifax, you know. Yes. So that That's the kind of stuff. So that holistic engagement is is one. That proactive approach is that save you all this reactive SecOps type type work is, is two. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit in there. And if you do things proactively, it's you're relying more on common sense than these narrow technical skills which opens up uh, who can actually do the work. And it also makes it far more relatable and understandable to non-technical management because you're doing things that are more common sense rather than these really specific cyber techie silo things. Um, yeah. so, so do you, do you think there's a, there's a, a balance between uh, what we need to do on the, the left that maybe very much to what you're saying is uh, proactive engagement, it's um, 
you know, uh, uh, simple to understand and therefore simple to implement, right? So without overcomplicating it to a, to an audience, but but also there is on on the right, you have to have the technical skills to support the delivery of what you're saying to the. To the well, left. well, you you need to have technical skills, but they don't necessarily. I, th I think technical skills are important because you you need them to understand what's actually happening on the ground. Now they don't have to be you know cyber security specific or cyber technology specific technical skills but you know you have to understand networking and os's and stuff and it's like you know why are these patches missing why is their network configured this way what's this addressing why aren't things being updated properly and you need that knowledge to then be able to create processes that will to to understand what the root cause of that is because yeah. uh you know somebody oh well this system got compromised why did it get compromised oh it was missing a patch okay install the patch that's fixed but why was it missing the patch why didn't your patching solution work? Why didn't the process work? Why was it missed? Oh, it, because we didn't have it. Oh, it's an asset management issue. So why didn't? Why wasn't it picked up? Why wasn't it put in the register? Why address those issues? And you find one problem, you address its root cause, and you fix that problem, but also every other instance of that problem. And chances are other problems as well. Uh, and you'll end up fixing problems in areas where you don't even have visibility to because you, you fix that root cause up there. Um, so yeah, that kind of proactivity. The analogy I give is the car factory where uh, sheet metal comes in, parts come in, and they you know, assembly line, and they put this car together, all these stations, and then you know it has to go into this parking lot to be sold, but they just chuck it from the third floor. And people yeah. come in and move it to a corner and start assessing what's wrong with it, what parts they need, what tooling they need. Uh, oh, God, we need a 1,000 more people. We need experts in this and this and this. We need to buy some tools. We need a management framework to organize all this. Uh, we need some compliance. We need some certifications. And meanwhile, you're like, why, why don't you fix the assembly line to come up the ground floor? And that's you see so much of that in in infosec and i, I saw a, a slide by an isc squared presentation where the top 20 roles in the uh, the cybersecurity skills gap and every single one of them is one of those parking lot roles there's no one is looking for people to go and improve business processes or to discover yeah. business and and align security to the it and business processes and that kind of stuff where you you'd mitigate the existence of these issues for which you're spending millions building socks to then chase up after. So, so, so it's it's effectively changing the narrative as to where cybersecurity should engage. Um, I, know, I don't know at what point we started doing things so far downstream. I think it's, you know, we, we, if you go back 20, 25 years when InfoSec kind of started in earnest, uh, I guess we we're all just really techies and uh, it was it was fine in our basement at home. But once you got into a business and you had to deal with people and, and business processes, we didn't know how to do that. And then we went to, to well, let's at least secure just a perimeter. And then it became a mess in there. And it, we should have just learned to address things proactively in line with the business. Build, if you build security into your business process, your business process always gets run, which means your security will get run. So you, you, yeah. you have to get that engagement upstream to get your security done at the site. You, know, you could call it security by design, but there's a, there's a big human element to it as well. And, and and it becomes behavioral and cultural, right? You know, so so without that, yes. it, it, that there's an element of psychology that's tied to the way that we yes. proceed. But it's interesting because I say human and cybersecurity people immediately assume end user awareness. But it's also a business. It's communicating to boards. It's it's building influence. It's building a brand. It's becoming someone worth listening to. It's it's influencing all these things so that you actually have the power within your organization. Say, so where you at this point now have influence on how a business process will get run, so that you don't suffer all these security issues from it, which we now only find out six months down the line when it's Friday night at four p.m. and oh, this business process is going live on Monday. Can you green stamp it or rubber stamp it? Um, so just that kind of stuff, just, just get stuff upstream and you know, stop firefighting and build the process. Like legacy systems are a good example. Everyone complains about legacy systems for years because they can't fix them. Well, they'll never put in the process that dictates how systems should be built. And then after five years, the legacy system, you know, total five years of complaining, 20 years of total life, the legacy system gets replaced by something that's just as unmaintainable. That's something that can't have, can't be patched, can't have downtime because you never got the engagement to put the process in the first place. Well, well, do that, with zero resource, you'll just, stuff will just age out. All the bad stuff will age out, then new stuff will be good. And, 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 in, and in a lot of cases, um, um, when you have legacy uh, architecture embedded for such a long period of time, you're more likely to um, 
reproduced like for like, uh, you know, bad for bad, um, in order to get to good. Um, so as a stepping stone, right? So even if you have end of life services, they're, they're, you know, you need to get them onto something new and more efficient and more effective. Yep. You're not going to re-engineer your entire uh, business process to be able to support what that new technology yeah. do. So is you're kind of an which, uh, which is one which is one reason why you have to approach it at such a high level and so holistically. And that that really means you know if you're if if your plan isn't hitting like the COO at the least. Then you're not thinking big enough because you you need a strategy that encompasses everything. Otherwise, you're tr you're trying to fix one area and it's just going to get pulled down by all the other areas. Okay. So it's that. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that it sounds sounds like an amazing book, and uh, I've I've ordered my copy. So look, look. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question for you uh, uh, from JJD. Uh, he goes. He's bought the book, even though he's an analyst. He'd like to know how uh, um, how he can complement the business, right? Even though he's an analyst, how can he start doing? stuff upwards rather than downstream so upstream rather than downstream i i think jj's beard already compliments enough <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that thing is epic uh, i mean i think everyone can contribute and i think a big part of of building that influence is um and i was saying this earlier on, on a different stream um become someone worth listening to uh break that cliche of security is the is the naysayer be altruistic go out and and help people that way you are you're building up your reputation because you may not always be an analyst i mean hopefully if you're if you're good at your job you'll you'll grow in seniority and then you'll be able to to uh, to influence and change more and more so and that's why i think you know most of this stuff is is aimed like i said at, at kind of middle management to to see so level but i think it's important to at least get these concepts in at the ground floor so that people grow with them in their careers uh, and just think of the big picture and think of how things fit together. Because uh, I worry that, you know, it used to be kind of a sysadmin and you do security as well. And you knew networking, you knew the OS, you knew all this stuff. And now stuff is so siloed. Like I, I met like a SOC analyst. That's like she didn't know how, how firewalls work. She didn't understand like IP and ports and stuff. I'm like, you work at a SOC. Like how, how is this possible? <laughs> um, and and she was being promoted to uh, to a consultant. I won't name which of the big four she worked for, but <laughs> um, I, I think anyway. one, one of one of the, one of the one of the problems we face though is um, you know we we as an industry practitioners have created that mess. We've we've we fractured and um, siloed these roles in a particular way, very much at a technical level. Um, I, we do I'm, like to structure things, don't we? We really like to organize things and. So we lose a lot of that human kind of yeah that glue, and 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 we've also lost the level of common sense, right? You know, um, in the way that sometimes we approach security. So I I I I, I wholeheartedly agree with you in in terms of rethinking the way that we approach it, especially at a at an executive level, because it is very much about enabling the business to do something. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, it's, it's interesting the, to see CISOs that are you know, new in role and within a couple of weeks, they're putting out POs to buy a bunch of tech. And I'm like, there's no way you've had time yeah. to understand your business. So how, yeah. how do you, what are you prioritizing? What are you, you I talked to, I've come across some, some heads of InfoSec and they've been in their job like five to 10 years. I do, I do the odd assessment and they've been there for five to 10 years. They can't name me what finance application their business uses. Like we, we need to really engage with the business. And by doing that, you get visibility. You find out what's out there. I mean, if you don't have that, you can't prevent it. From and, 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 and to sort of extend that trail of thought is also about not blaming people. I think the one, one of the biggest failures I've seen with a lot of uh, um, CISOs and heads of security is um, you go in all guns blazing. You're, you're saying you've got this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, this out date, this is silly, this is that. And, and, it, and it carries a very negative tone. Actually, if you, if you, if you want to be successful as a, as a cybersecurity leader in that thought leadership role, you've got to partner with your business and be able to explain to them very clearly, not always necessarily in, in brisk terms, but to explain to them what's, what's being done well and what isn't. Um, and then take very practical and pragmatic steps to be able to go and fix it. And not all of that means rush to go buy a piece of tin or rush to go buy some software. So, yeah. I mean, I mean I, you, you beat me to it because what I was going to add is like you, you need to have those interactions to find out what's there. But when you're doing that, you're also developing the relationships and yeah. you're finding out. 
if people so much, they're so used to security just saying no to everything. If you just go and meet people for a cup of coffee, because I'll, I'll get this all the time, I'll just get like a nasty email because they just anticipate I'm going to say no. And I'm like, well, what is it you guys do? It's like, oh, we're a research lab in so and so building. It's like, when can we have a coffee? And and you go and they're like, this is when it starts, you know. But within five minutes, you're like, okay, so explain to me how you do it. Okay, let me. And they just see you thinking, oh, how can I enable you to do this in a way that works? It's just the fact that you're putting in that effort, it, it changes the relationship completely. And then it's like, look, it's, it's always been this way. I just want to make it better. I don't want to hinder you. And that fear of reporting things or not mentioning when they're doing a change goes away. And next thing you know, they become your eyes and ears all over the organization. So that you, you create this kind of spider web of, of human relationships and, and eyes and ears everywhere. But, and, I, but I, I, I think, you know, you touched on a really good point about, about human interaction. I think that if you are, if you are an organization that has a firm consequence management process where it's built into the culture that you're going to be reprimanded for the things that you do wrong, um, and generally that starts with physical security or even cyber security, you know, penalization or penalties or demerits or whatever you want to call it, uh, I, I, I think it then breeds fear um, yeah. within the organization, and therefore you're never going to get a an accurate picture because people are just not going to communicate with you. Because most, most people will do the right thing. If they're doing the wrong thing, it's that they just didn't know better in, in most yep. cases, to be honest. And if, if you get very, and it's the same thing with policing, if policing gets overzealous, you start breeding dissent. Like people will, will literally psychologically do what they're not supposed to do, not because they want to, but literally just to give you the finger. Yeah, yeah. It actually becomes you know psychology. Psychology is, is a weird thing, but let, yeah. let, let keep 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 everyone on lockdown for six months and then see what happens, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I, I, I yeah, big fan of that positivity and that proactivity. It, it's it can be, um, it, it can be challenging to tell people to work in a different way, and that and some people can get defensive. So it's very important to. To keep it positive and 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 i think that defense is also born out of if someone's done it and, the, and you know i don't really like the saying that you know done it this way it's it's the right way to do it because we've always done it this way yeah. and there are a lot of people with that mentality i think the world has changed quite significantly where you know if i'm in an organization and you find that someone's been doing something that's inappropriate versus actually i didn't know i was doing it that's a whole different conversation yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and i think you just go and support and and provide the right level of guidance, the right level of counsel, you know, the the, the, the right level of support. Um, and I'm not worried about penalizing people. I'm I'm more worried I'm I'm more looking towards supporting into their goals and their activities and so that's I mean the, the people very few people actually need to be punished. I mean if yeah. if they're just that if they're that bad, they'll that attitude will usually reflect its, itself elsewhere, not just in cybersecurity. And it, it's usually not too, you know, and, it's and, a one in a thousand case. I, I suppose the other thing is, I think, I think successful CISOs don't walk around with chips on their shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> or That's successful head of all leaders of any kind, you know, uh, be a bit humble in the way that you approach the work that you do. I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just it's just seeing very... someone lock their screen is like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, great stuff. so, so uh, moving on 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 the little time that we've got left. So, what do, you, what do you think about what's going on in the world today around cyber? I mean, I just mentioned three news stories. Are there any other things that you think are, are worth talking about? Let's let's just go through those stories. <laughs> <laughs> My mind is a blank all the time. It's okay. how I get through life. Okay. Otherwise, I'd have to worry about everything. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so, so what, what's your take on 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 the Marriott? Um, see, I, I've mentioned the Marriott, the original Marriott thing, in in several talks of mine. Uh, it's actually, I think it's mentioned in the book as well. Um, I think now it was only like yesterday or the day before that it came out, right? Yeah. I think, and I saw this post of like, oh, it must be that time of year where Marriott gets breached again. Which, you know, <laughs> people are being, you know, security people are being our, our usual cynical selves. Honestly, I think people are kind of overblowing this one. How very unsecurity person of me, I know. But you know, from my understanding, is this was unauthorized access or. Oh, compromised credentials, right? Was it compromised? Because my understanding was it was simply left open. I I, I read two articles that suggested it was a comp two compromised credentials. Okay. That led to the leak, and they're suggesting that the leak then is of 
certain value of data. Yeah, okay, that that should have been uh, that should have been caught because my understanding was basically it was it was kind of a levers process where they didn't remove access to this. So I was like, well, these people had access to this data, you know, a day before when they were still employees, and it's fine, and now they've got access to it, so it's it's not the end of the world. Um, and let's be honest probably 90% of the organizations out there struggle with this kind of thing. Uh, joiners, leavers, movers processes are rarely very good. Um, they almost always have gaps, especially in the, in the moving uh, yeah. departments. Um, if, if it was, if, I mean, if, if they were compromised, yeah, you probably should have had some MFA on there. Mm -hmm. So that, that, yeah, you you would think that after everything that happened to them, they they would have done at least that much. Do you do you think that um, out of the six thousand six hundred locations that, that that hotel operate, and they cannot determine um, the volume of this particular breach, and right. therefore hitting multiple jurisdictions of of data protection and privacy, do you think it warrants the ICO then launching a subset investigation because? They wouldn't. They wouldn't, um, or haven't, in the eyes of potentially the ICO, learned their lesson. I wonder. I wonder if that may not be one of the reasons why the disclosure was somewhat delayed, because they may be struggling to figure that out themselves. Yeah. Uh, one, and the reasons I, I mentioned Marriott um, in some of my talks is that I don't know what the original cause of the Starwood compromise was. But Marriott bought them, did an M&A, didn't catch anything. Mm -hmm. and then I believe four years later, figured mm -hmm. out oh, we've been breached. And then the interesting thing is they finally announced they would breach some time after. And then they went out and said, uh, oh, we've lost X amount of records. 332 million. But at, at first, the, the first announcement was we lost X records. And then it was a couple of weeks later, like, oh, we've also lost Y amount of passports. And then <laughs> a few weeks after that was, oh, we've lost uh, Z amount of additional passports, but they were encrypted, which I love that because, I mean, if I've got root on your server, your database encryption means nothing to me yeah. because the server is going to decrypt it for me. But the interesting thing is that three different announcements, several weeks apart, about finding realizing that they've lost data, which to me means you bought this company four years ago and you still don't know where the data is. So what have you been doing in these four years? You, you, you clearly had data. You didn't know where it was at the time of reporting the breach. It took you weeks to find it and then more weeks to find more and then more weeks to find more. So you, you'd never, in this four years time that passed between the acquisition, you never standardized anything. You never yeah. applied your processes, your standardized platforms. You, you never aggregated things or homogenized the infrastructure. Why did you have the same kind of data in different formats in different places? That kind of thing. Oh, it's the worst time to deliver a package. <laughs> <All right. laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to pause Why um, Greg goes and deals with whoever knocks at his door. Um, so um, – if you bear with us for a second, I'm sure he'll be back. But in your life happens. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so that, that seems, and that's kind of, to me, that's that's a, a cultural and organizational issue uh, where you're lacking that visibility. And it, an organization that size, I mean, it was only, it, it's going to take some time to fix that. So I wouldn't yeah. be surprised, even in the best case scenario where they're genuinely working towards it with all the best intentions. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they weren't done yet. So my, my counter argument to that is if they'd learned their lesson from the last breach, they would have effectively implemented solutions to prevent things like this from happening again. They, they should have implemented stuff on, they should have done a top to down review and implemented all kinds right? of things. You know, uh, uh, so, so this sounds like a very uh, lax control you know, uh, if it is the case of either which way, whether it was a levers process that failed or whether it was, you know, compromised accounts, either which, from a technical level, that's a really low common denominator type of yeah. control. That you can I, I mean, they seem, I mean, I'm just pulling data out of, you know, yeah. make, drawing conclusions on a little bit of information yeah. we had, but it, it seems like, inside that network, it's quite disorganized. There's stuff all over the place. It's yeah. probably very low levels of maturity in 
the, the IT process is little on the security one. Yeah. Uh, IT and business process of, you know, because, because this data is, is all over the place, yet it's still being accessed globally. So, you know, whether I use my, my points card here or in Thailand, I mean, they, they're clearly storing different people's data in different places, but when you're using your card, so everything's connected together, but somehow, so they, they have a, a larger IT challenge of unifying all that data. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's that's an issue. But yeah, if you've got a massive breach with a $100 million fine, yeah. MFA, MFA, you know, MFA is a thing. Like uh, yeah. <laughs> some some basic things should have been done. Um, I don't know. It's it's too early, and we don't have enough information. I don't I don't want to be overly harsh uh, because it is it well, is the kind of compromise that can easily happen to all of us. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an unfolding story. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so Zoom, what's your take on Zoom? It's garbage. Next question. <laughs> I mean, Do you mean garbage or your take is garbage which <laughs> well, what can we say about zoom i mean from from circumventing the security mechanisms in ios last year so you wouldn't have to click on it there's kind of a pattern you know so it's a, it's a cultural thing and i i do this in assessments a lot like just just be intuitive just get a feel for it like i don't need to know what your processes are your systems and your tooling I'm like if if you've done thing a and that, to me, shows you're extremely likely to have screwed up thing B, C, D, and E, and F. Uh, there just seems to be quite a significant pattern of security lapses, but not just security lapses, but kind of ethical slash privacy lapses with, you know, there's the LinkedIn integration, there's the sending data to Facebook from iOS apps. Um, do they not have a DPO who's advising them that this may not be a good idea? Um, plus, you know, the, the weak encryption, the lack of end-to-end -end encryption, all this stuff. I find it, it interesting because there's, there's a lot of different video conferencing providers, right? I'm not sure why Zoom has overtaken all the others so, so significantly. Isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, to your point, they, it's free, but they say it's an enterprise focused <laughs> as an enterprise cloud system. <laughs> and I, and I, I love their excuse of like, oh, well, we, we weren't expecting everyone to start using it overnight. It was like, so it was fine when millions of people were getting compromised and the media wasn't talking about it. But now that it's 100 million and the media is talking about it, it's a problem. So that that and, was and built for enterprise. So if you go back and have a look at the blog, it's saying I'm built for enterprise. So. That was very weak. But what, what strikes me as interesting is that it's it's a massive company. I mean, I, I don't know what their market cap is, but uh, it, it spiked to be higher than all U.S. airlines combined, apparently. <laughs> some, some absurd thing like that. Like you, you've got the money and the component technology. So you've got different, uh, you know, video conferencing products. It's it's mostly about the interface and how they work and the UI and the UX. The underlying technology of video codecs and end-to-end -end encryption and you know validation and, and, and Facebook sign-ins, that's pretty standard. So how, how did you screw all this up? These are all like really standardized technologies that are used time and time again in other areas perfectly fine. And they, I mean, it, it actually, if you just literally cookie cutter take that and implement it in your product, you're fine. So they, it seems like they've made an active effort to screw it up. I'm, I'm sorry, but. Do, do you think governments should be using them to, to, to host cabinet meetings? I don't think anyone should be using it. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if you're going to have your, your you know, Friday evening virtual drinks, sure. You know, if you want to talk to mom, as long as you're not giving your credit card stuff. I mean, you know, no, no one's going to compromise your session in the odd chance that you may have. But, you know, you, you might get some prankster. Or just, but just as a, as a basic principle, why would you use a product? For. Forget, designed. forget the security yeah. uh, issues. Just just from a privacy standpoint, why would you use a product from a company that has you know willfully you know taken a piss at, at your privacy and sells your data? Like ethically, there's some challenges there. Yeah, and uh, that that's that's why I'm being much harsher on them than I'm being on on Marriott because it just yeah. seems like there's. It's it's the ethos behind it that bothers me more than anything. No, no, no Christmas card for you from Zoom. It looks like me. Sorry, guys. Uh, um, okay, uh, and and to close off, uh, um, the scumbags that are attacking um, the WHO and other institutions as a result of COVID nineteen outbreak. Right. Well, That's disgusting. What can I say? Balance. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it seems to be mostly DDoS. 
um, and like the the Italian. Um, the, sorry, I just saw a question. The Italian is Ryan Ward. Which would rather have control or visibility over your environment? You'd much rather have control because visibility will only give you nightmares. Um, yeah, but you need you need both. They're intertwined. Um, in fact, there are two metrics I use. One is visibility, one is control, one is capability, or control capability and maturity, and one feeds into the other. Anyway, back to uh, WHO. The, the, yeah. the Italian uh, IMSS, which is their kind of uh, social security, national insurance number website, they do all the unemployment benefits and, uh, and other benefits, including the, the, the COVID-19 payouts that they have. Uh, they got DDoS, they're offline. So people cannot collect that. Now, the interesting thing is, demand on these uh, websites and this infrastructure right now is sky high. They were saying they were getting 100 presumably legitimate requests per second. Uh, so it doesn't actually, you know, they're, they're probably over 100% capacity as it is. So it doesn't really take much of a DDoS to then tip it over and into, uh, into no man's land. But yeah, I mean, what, what can I say? I mean, DDoS mitigation, a lot of these places are charities or they're institutions and they don't necessarily have uh, the money for it, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 sorry, John. No, I mean, I'm, uh, I mean, it's, it's inexcusable, uh, but at the same time, you know, you, even if you're a charity or, or a government institution, it just shows that you, you do need to protect yourself. Uh, I also think as, um, and some people have been doing good, like volunteer efforts to band together to help healthcare, uh, cybersecurity professionals to help them out free of charge, because you know we shouldn't we shouldn't be billing them money in their hour of need while they're trying to help everybody else. Um, but yeah, there's there's just not much to say about it. It's just it's yeah. Really so, so. Well, Greg, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Uh, wish you all the success with your with your new book. Uh, and I hope everything goes well. Uh, keep yourself safe, uh, and hopefully we can have you back on sometime soon. Sure, It'd be my pleasure. Okay, cheers. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. And, and that's that, guys. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, again.